so yeah, I'm here to talk about change and creativity and, and how they relate to each other. Uh, I'll try to keep it short so you guys can get back to work, which I'm sure you want to do on a Friday. Uh, so let's talk about it. In my experience, there's three ways that people react to change, right? There are people that, that panic, right? That's, a, that's like a gut instinct. Um, there's people that avoid or, or, or ignore that change. Uh, and, and then there's people that adapt to it. And adaptation is, is, is a creative process when, when change occurs. Uh, so, so that's really what we want to aim for, right? Um, so the first thing I did when Doug asked me to speak was I, I panicked, right? Because usually when people ask me to speak, they want to know how uh, mobile has changed the landscape and, and how, how we keep creative when we've got 12-month product cycles from Google and, and Apple. Uh, but I decided I was going to change that up. And, and instead of, of going through a talk that, you know, I, I, I've given many times in the same position, um, I was going to tell more of a personal story and, and how change kind of, uh, a recent change spurred me creatively. This is Gary Rock. This is, this is my dad. Um, so in order to tell this story, I've, I've got to go into a little bit of history on, on him. He worked in the construction industry for 45 years, which is longer than most of us in this room have been alive. Um, and through that, that work history, he learned how to be resourceful. When you work in an in industry like that for that long, you become uh, you know, a supervisor at a certain point. And his kind of claim to fame in the industry was he, he was more of a wartime general. There's a big difference between a peacetime general and a wartime general, right? Peacetime generals have resources and time, and they can think about leadership, and they, they can kind of curate process. When you're a wartime general, you're given no resources, limited budgets, uh, the job is over, the money's spent, and somebody has to come in and make it work. Uh, that, that, that's been his history. So uh, a couple jobs he did um, over time, uh, he invented a scissor jack system that operated with a crane. They had to go into 100-year-old buildings on, on military bases and cut in ADA-compliant Americans with Disability Act uh, elevator shafts, and they said it was impossible. And it, it would cost, you know, millions and millions of dollars. And he, he'd just tell them, give me two weeks. He, and he invented a scissor jack that, that helped them pour concrete elevator shafts. Uh, there was an Air Force base, and they were repaving the runway, and it was a cold, wet winter, and there's no way to get it done. He put together a, a hoop tent structure over the entire runway, figured out how to heat it, and, and poured the job under time and under budget. So he's a master of being creative and resourceful, right? Uh, anyone ever been to Virginia Beach? Okay. Been on the boardwalk at all? Okay, if you're on the beach and you turn and you look towards uh, the resort area, you will see a concrete seawall. Uh, it's got fish and turtles and waves and Army Corps of Engineers symbols on it. Um, there's a part of that, that boardwalk that got done with big players with a lot of money and a lot of time. And then as they went down the road and they got higher into the street numbers, all of a sudden there was no money and nobody wanted anything to do with the project. And he was working for a smaller company, and they, they bid it, and, and they didn't know how they were going to build these forms. Uh, how, they were, how were they going to do the art? Because the art was, was done street by street by artists. Um, and he, he said, give me, you know, give me a couple weeks. I'll figure it out. Uh, and, he, and he did. So here's a couple shots of it. Um, they poured this whole thing. He built these forms. Uh, he built like rubber molds that he poured around artwork that my mother did. She, she made clay fish and turtles and waves and all, all kinds of sea life. Uh, and they, they, he built all these forms and he got them out there and he taught everybody how to pour the concrete and he got the job done uh, under time and under budget. Uh, and he did it in our garage. So you, you really need to think about, you know, what resources you have at hand and, and use them to the fullest of their ability. And this is something I, I learned from him pretty, pretty early on, right? Um, in the 80s, I don't know if anybody remembers Omni. It was like a kind of a sci-fi magazine, right? 
And, and Omni was great because it was always talking about what the future was going to be like. Uh, at one point, he picked up an issue and it was talking about lasers and how lasers were going to change the future and it will commercialize and it'll be the next big thing. And, and he kind of got obsessed with the idea of building his own laser. So in his spare time on nights and weekends, he did. He, he built it out of PVC and threaded rod. He hand polished mirrors with jeweler's rouge. If you've ever seen that, it looks like the surface of Mars. It gets all over everything. And my mother wanted to kill him. Um, but but he, he did it just because he wanted to prove that he could, right? He also got a black market Vepco transformer. Nobody knows how he got it. You, you can see them hanging out on that pole, for those of you who can see. <laughs> Same thing. Now, it looks, they look small on a pole, but, but in, in your garage, it, it takes up a good, good amount of room. When he finally offloaded it, the power company, uh, they, they didn't know how he got it, and they, they, were, they were pretty angry, but they eventually did haul it away. Um, so after that, he, he kind of experimented with more things to do on the side. Uh, he got interested in neon, so he got some neon, he got some argon, he built a bench, he learned how to blow glass, bend glass, and he, and he did a side business building neon signs. So he was always doing things creatively, and, and it, it, again, it reinforced in me that there, there really was nothing stopping you from learning something that you wanted to learn, even if it was difficult and you, you really had no resources to teach you. Uh, so because of that, I was always making stuff. Right, I was making things. I was I I was making little inventions and and like crazy, dangerous soapbox derby cars and model rockets uh, and and things like that. And I got really interested in inventing. I don't know if anybody remembers Invent America when when maybe you were a kid. It was not super popular, but uh, for nerdy kids like me, it was it was pretty cool. That's not me, uh, <laughs> but. In the fourth grade, I decided I was going to enter, right? So first you got to have a problem, right? We had this cat, he was a, he was a tomcat, uh, didn't like baths. So my idea was to take uh, that tomcat and, and figure out if I could build a nylon harness. So we sewed together a nylon harness, and then could we, could we attach that to a bin slowly and carefully and, and put the cat in, in like basically a tub with a with a cork so that, so that after you were done spraying them, you, you could just get the water out of there. I, I invented a cat bath, um, <laughs> which looking at it now, I, I, I don't have any pictures of it, thank God, but it was, it was really a torture device, but <laughs> it, uh, it won second place. So I guess, I guess the judges were dog people, but, but again, I, I had just watched him do so many things with household stuff, right? And I figured I could do it too. Um, yeah. So the, the, the problem was everything he wanted to do was super dangerous. All right. There were three kids in the house. And we, all we wanted to do was get our hands on this stuff. You know, lasers, neon, heat, glass, broken glass everywhere, jeweler's rouge. Uh, there was really nothing that we could do with him. We had to stand back. We literally had something in the garage called a dead man switch that kept electricity from arcing when you were working with it at high voltage. So, so he finally did get interested in something that, that I, I could work with him on, right? Uh, computer shows used to come through. This is when people really started to get interested in mass market PCs, okay? Not the early stuff, not the pioneering stuff, but you wanted to build your own computer out of parts. Uh, this was the only way we were gonna be able to afford to do it. So when I was around 10, we kind of started going to these shows together and we bought pieces part by part, all right? And over probably a year to year and a half, two years, we finally got all the pieces that we needed to assemble that PC for the first time. We worked on it together. It taught me a lot about computers. Um, it taught me how everything worked and what, what all the pieces and components were. And we finally got to the point where we could install Windows 3.1 on it. And that, that was a huge day. Um, and, and that's what started my interest in software. Now, software is unique because you can make things without raw materials. And that doesn't seem like a big deal, but when you're a kid and you don't have lumber, you don't have nylon straps and Rubbermaid tubs you can, you can cut up, uh, you, you kind of are limited by what you can do. The idea that you could 
code things, and if it didn't work, you could delete it and just start over, and all you spent was time, was, was, was radical to me. So the problem we had was, this was 1991, 1992. The internet was, mass market internet was really in its infancy. Uh, that's a modem, if nobody knows what a 56K modem looks like or sounds like. And uh, we didn't have one because we just didn't. And if we did, we would have been using bulletin boards and Prodigy and, and maybe the infancy of AOL, but we didn't have access. I didn't have access. I didn't have anybody that could teach me software. Uh, and I couldn't get on my bike and go buy a book because, you know, I was a kid. So I did, you know, other stuff with my computer. Like, I played <laughs> video game. I played Doom. All the, well, I mean, everybody's played Doom, right? But no, that's not all I did with it. I, I, I started to use the primitive art programs on there, right? So paint, you know, I used to just sit and draw things in Microsoft Paint all day. And then we got a copy of Corel Draw, and I started to understand vector drawing. And I would make maps for social studies class and, and silly stuff and draw characters. And, and then I started to draw software because I really wanted to understand how it worked. That led me into learning the basics of HTML. We eventually did get a modem and I was able to look at the source code and, and all I needed was a notepad to write this stuff. It was, it was pretty amazing. Which led me into JavaScript, which was a simple scripting language that kind of helped control HTML. And over the years, I got into Flash. I know that's not cool now, but you got to remember that that was pretty cool for a long time to move something across the screen that you drew, um, which led me into a, 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 a derivative called Shockwave, which is scripted with something called Lingo. That allowed me to move really high fidelity graphics across the screen and do animations. And they started to bring in 3D. And I started to do 3D modeling and start to understand things in a three-dimensional space. So, Eventually, by the time I'm in high school, I do have resources. I can go talk to a teacher. I can get access to books. And I start to learn C and C++ at a basic level, right? So uh, we'll fast forward a little, because uh, we don't have time for this story. But uh, I do eventually get into a job where I'm allowed to start to write software. And I start at a couple different companies in uh, Newport News, kind of the Hampton Roads area. And I, and I, I kind of go through these companies and, and I, I get a better grasp. And by the end of it, I'm writing fairly competent training software, right? And I still have to be creative and resourceful be, because, you know, ultimately it was still me kind of teaching myself how this stuff works. But we were shipping production software. And, uh, you know, it was, it was great. It was a little boring. And you knew that what you made was going to end up in a desk drawer somewhere, typically. And then the iPhone came out. Did anyone have the original iPhone here? <laughs> did anyone wait in line for it? Okay, uh, I did. Because <laughs> I had never seen anything like this, right? It, it, was, it was meshing together the physicality of, of an object and software into something that you could touch and you could hold. And for the first time, it looked meaningful and it looked right and it felt right. The, like the jeweled little icons and everything that you could interact with. They were like little, little machines, these pieces of software that I could hold. And so it kind of brought me back to when I was a kid and I was making things. Um, then they opened it up for people to make stuff, right? And I jumped in. And in those early days, all you could do was base your knowledge on uh, Apple's operating system and how to program for it. There were no books on what's, what was called iPhone OS back then. You had to figure it out. Well, I was pretty good at that at that point, so I did. I figured it out. I started, came up with an idea. I, I figured out how to use the Coco SDKs that Apple uses. And I wrote our first, designed and wrote and shipped our first app. It was called Tumblrette. It's a Tumblr client for iPhone. Um, it, which eventually Tumblr acquired from us, and that became Tumblr's original iPhone app. And, and we still work with them today on their app. Um, but that was the beginnings of Mobilux, right? That was, that was how the company started. Uh, Garrett, my business partner, he kind of, he went down to the city and got the certificate and, and figured out the business side of things, and I figured out the product side of things. And that went on. I mean, we're into it now for, for eight years and uh and we've grown quite a bit and we've gotten pretty good at making software from everyone from iHome to, to Ford. Uh, but 
something started to happen to me. I, I started to get to the point where making software wasn't the same as making things, like physical things. It's just not. And it, it really started to bug me. And, uh, and then towards the end of 2012, like I was kind of hitting a point where I really wanted to get into making something real again. And that's when I got a phone call that my dad was in the hospital. So a couple days before Christmas 2012, I get a call and, or from him, and he says that he's not feeling too well and he doesn't think he's going to make it down for Christmas, right? Okay, no big deal. A couple days later, I get a call from a doctor that he's in the emergency room. Uh, so all the kids rushed to, he was in Woodbridge, Virginia, doing a job there. And uh, over the next few days, we learned that he has acute pancreatitis. Now, that's not something that, that typically really is life-threatening unless you've had his medical history. He's had renal cancer three times, okay? So he may not make it through this hospital visit. And we stay with him uh, through Christmas. Uh, here's our Christmas dinner. We had to go to a Honduran restaurant down the street because nothing's open on Christmas. Um, and we start to like, you know, get him through the process and work with the doctors and figure out what's going on. Uh, so days go by, um, but eventually he does pull through the pancreatitis and one gallbladder later, we get him down to Richmond and he's recovering with us and uh, he, he, he makes it through that bout. Well, six months go by and his job has fired him because he's a 62 year old man with a medical history that can't work anymore in the sun. He's having, you know, issues. He was, he was extremely weak. He just, he could not work construction at that point. So you start burning through the money you've saved, right? But he's got enough put away that we can kind of get through that phase. And then nine months go by. And at that point, he's up and he's really be able to work uh, on something, but he can't go down and do that kind of work anymore again. It's just not going to happen for him. Uh, the only job that they were offering him was building condos down in Florida, and that heat and humidity w would, is not compatible with somebody that was in his condition. So he started thinking about how he could be resourceful again. All that stuff he had made and he had bought over the years, you know, he'd acquired like a cheap commercial laser, he'd acquired a little CNC machine, and, and he had a basic capability in a box that he's been traveling around the country with. Could he make something with that? So he buckles down and he starts thinking about product ideas. Um, and meanwhile, there's another change happening to me. Uh, I become a father, right? So now we're, this is early uh, 2014. Um, and I take some time off from work. I, I, I get to stay home with Wilson and kind of learn what it's like to be a new dad. Um, and then I go back to work after the time off and Things are just a little different for me. It's changed. Uh, I'm, you know, worried about my dad. I I'm worried about being at home with my son. And, and the company itself is just not the same company. When there are six or seven of us, it's very important that I be there for everything that happened as like its creative steward and its product director, right? But that's not true when there's nearly 30 of you anymore. You don't need to be involved in every little thing. So I felt a little bit on the outside when I came back. And that kind of led into other things. But, but ultimately, we get into about 18 months after the incident. And, uh, and he's out of ideas now. Like, he tried to do some product stuff. Um, I'm struggling. He's struggling. And we're trying to figure out how to keep him around his grandson and, and how to, like, be fulfilled creatively and everybody makes some money, right? Because that was desperately important. And I don't know why it hadn't dawned on me before, but we had all this software that we'd written. We had all these clients and they don't just need software. Sometimes they need collateral. They, they need physical items that, that they can give away or that, that go uh, for various things. And one of them we had was Elixir and, and we were going to South by Southwest with it. And, they needed to have something to give away. 
So we started thinking about it. What could we make? What could he make that we could design? And we put them together and we can give this thing away. And it dawned on us eventually that a cork coaster would be really cool. Like a cork coaster, like a beach house cork coaster, right? But we're gonna take it and we're gonna laser engrave a design on it. So that's what we did. We got some cork sheet, we milled it down, cut it out, we bullnosed it by hand, and then we went to work uh, designing for it, and then, and then we got a bunch of them engraved, and we, and we took it down there, and, you know, people loved it. So we went, well, who else do we have that wants something, right? And we were working with an airline down in Texas that had just booted up, and what they wanted to do was give their initial clients uh, like a gift, right? Like something that says that they're a member. So we started thinking, what, what could we make together? Uh, to give to these guys and, and we came up with this idea for a membership kit, right? You'd get a card, you'd get a luggage tag, you'd get some coupons to give away and we, we went to work again like, well, what are we going to make it out of? How are we going to make it? We would brainstorm, we'd get creative, we'd figure out how to be resourceful. Where could we get the leather? Where could we get the wood? And we ended up shipping a membership kit with a black anodized steel cut card that we laser etched name and number out of, a piece of walnut and some leather that we attached and we engraved with the member's name. And that luggage tag was really cool. Like there was, there's definitely something there. So. Then we, we all kind of hit the pause button and went, okay, we can't do this commercially. MobileX is not set up to be a shop building collateral for other companies. Um, so what else could we do? I mean, maybe it doesn't have to be under MobileX. Maybe we don't have to make things for clients. Maybe we could make products. Maybe I could start making things again, real things. And, and maybe he could help manufacture those things. So we started thinking about that luggage tag and how great it would be to build a good one. I mean, everyone in here probably has luggage and it probably has a luggage tag on it, right? And you're probably still writing on a piece of paper and sticking it under a piece of vinyl. And that's pretty horrible looking, to be honest. It's the last thing that they think about. Well, what if it was the first thing that somebody thought about? So we start iterating on the design and we start talking to him. Um, and we kind of come up with these mantras, right? Like, what if people could customize it themselves? Uh, what if it was infused with technology? What if there was real human craftsmanship that happened on every single one? So we took those tenants and, and we thought about it and, and we thought about it for a year. We worked on this, we worked on the processes and what it was and how it was going to work and how people would experience it. And uh, we finally came up with something that we really loved and that he could make. It brought together what I did and what he did in a really interesting way, right? Like, who has access to their own software company? Like, well, well, we can do technology the right way, like nobody's ever done with something like this. And he could bring his resourcefulness and creativity to the mix to manufacture stuff. So we start thinking about how, how are we gonna pull this thing off? And we came up with processes and every other thing we needed, all the millions of ideas it takes to build a product in a company. So that meant he needed to learn how to mill lumber because you can't get good plywood that isn't a 64th of an inch thick, right? You need it to be nice and thick and hold up in the weather and not bend. So he makes his own plywood by hand. He came up with a process that takes that time down to nothing. Um, I had to learn how to work with leather, where to source it, where to where to buy it, how to cut it, how to finish it, how to emboss it. And so I got to go back in and make again. And it just refueled me and him creatively. Um, so we figured out all those problems. And I guess what I, I kind of want to leave everyone with today is when these changes occur, there are those three ways that you can deal with them, right? You can panic or you can ignore them or you can adapt to them. And I found that through adaptation, like that's actually where the creativity came through uh, in that kind of like heat and friction of, of constraint and uncertainty. That's where the creativity lives. Um, and this is just one story, but I mean, this was a clear case of like getting creative uh, when, when a big change happens to your life. And, and it's, it's really helped me um, to understand how to react appropriately. So when these big changes happen to you, I would, I would implore you to, instead of panicking or, or ignoring them, adapt to them. Make things with other people, right? Uh, whether those people are your coworkers, whether those people are your friends, or in my case, uh, the people that taught you to be creative in the first place. Thanks.